Hey everyone, welcome to my 2021 Azure Infrastructure State of the Union. Really my goal is to just go over the fundamentals, the building blocks of the various infrastructure services that we might use directly for infrastructure, things like VMs and VM scale sets, but also on which the higher level kind of app services, the data services are actually built on. As I'm sure you can imagine, there's a lot of work goes into creating this, so a like, subscribe, comment, and share would definitely be appreciated. Now, my goal is to go over a very wide range of topics at a fairly shallow level. Um, if you're looking for kind of deeper dives into them, if you go to my YouTube channel, um, I do actually then have like an Azure Masterclass, which is like 20 hours of content as a playlist for that. I have deep dives into various different topics. So those are the places you can go on and get more detail. Again, my goal for this is to really be at a, a shallower level, but to give you kind of the breadth of the different components, where we are kind of in 2021, and really how they fit together. Now, I think that the best way to start thinking about, well, what are these core services, is we always think about the, the shift from on-premises to the cloud, and the shifts of different responsibilities. And the easiest way to kind of start from that is if I think about just what are the different layers involved? Well, we always think about, well, fundamentally, you have kind of a data center. And in that data center, you have different things. For example, I can think about within that data center, I have network. I have storage. I have compute services, i.e. servers. Then I'm probably running some kind of hypervisor. Could be Hyper-V, could be ESX, something else. Then in there I get kind of my operating system, different types of runtime, middleware. And so I actually get what I care about that provides the business value, which is kind of the application and then the data. Now, for these things, on-premises, and really what is on-premises? On-premises is essentially, well, I have some facility that provides capacity. It provides capacity in terms of um, amounts of storage and network connectivity and compute that I then serve up through services. And very commonly in an on-premises world, that capacity is really served up as VMs onto which I put stuff. And while we're going to talk about a lot of different topics, fundamentally, if you think about what is the cloud, the cloud is really just capacity as well, spread over lots of different regions. But rather than just being kind of virtual machines, there's a whole set of different services that are exposed and I can then leverage to really maximize, hey, I wanna spend time on my app, I don't wanna worry about all these different things. Now, when I think about that on-premises, if I think kind of my on-premises environment, I'm essentially responsible for all of this. I'm responsible for every single component. I pick my data centers, I pick locations close to maybe my users or my customers. I'm responsible for network infrastructure, the storage could be SANS, uh, network attached storage. What are my servers? What's my hypervisor? I do everything. When we think about the cloud, this shifts. So as soon as I go to the cloud, and the first thing we think about is always kind of infrastructure as a service, IaaS. And the line for any cloud service, no matter what we do, always kind of starts here. So I can really think about, in the cloud, I'm never dealing with a hypervisor or a server or storage or network. I don't do those things. Instead, those elements are surfaced up to me as different types of service. But in the cloud, these are always the responsibility of the cloud vendor. Now I can kind of attribute, so what are these various types of things in the cloud? What would an equivalent be of a service that's exposed to me? So if I think about well, data centers, when the cloud, these could be different regions 
I can use. You'll hear things about availability zones, maybe availability sets. So some kind of physical isolation or proximity. There are also things like proximity placement groups, if I want to keep things close together. So there are types of resources that are exposed to me that would kind of map in a little way to what I used to think about as data centers. Now, from a network perspective, obviously the big thing here is things like virtual networks. So VNets and subnets. From a security perspective and isolation, we think about things like all network security groups and application security groups. And I'm going to go over all of these things. We think about user-defined routing to control the actual routes. We think about peering to connect things together. There are gateways, there's express route, there's VPN, there's all these other types of services, network appliances, there are Azure Firewall, Azure Virtual WAN. Different types of service exposed to me that I can consume for networking. For storage, well again, there's huge numbers of services. There's things like disks. So when I deal with virtual machines, I think about these managed disks that are of different kind of access performance tiers to me. There are just storage accounts that expose different types of service. There are database offerings managed from SQL, from Postgres, MySQL, MariaDB, Cosmos DB, all these other types of capability. There's Azure NetApp files. And then when we get to things like the compute and the hypervisor, well, there's different types of service. So these things I can often kind of think about, they're going to get lumped into things like virtual machines, virtual machine scale sets, various types of worker nodes for Kubernetes, for app service plans. So we're not dealing with the actual underlying network infrastructure or storage or servers. We get these different services exposed up to us. And when we think about responsibilities, so these are always, these days, no matter what, these are always the responsibility of fundamentally, this is always Azure's responsible for kind of the health, and they provide like service level agreements about the availability of these services. Now in an IaaS world, I'm therefore responsible for everything inside the OS and above. I can pick, hey, I can pick if I want it to be kind of Windows or I want it to be Linux. I can pick if it's an image available from the marketplace or I can bring my own image. And although I'm responsible, there are still things in Azure to help me. So if I think about, well, anti-malware. So there's things like anti-malware extensions. So I can think about, well, there's anti-malware. There's things like backup extensions. There's ability to do things like replication. There are hookings to do desired state configuration. And much, much more. Uh, even patching. There's extensions around patching. There's even a whole auto-management capability now that I can turn on and it, it does a whole bunch of those things for me. But I'm responsible for turning those things on, saying I want them, but I can pretty much do anything I want. Now, one of the things you may be saying is, well, okay, uh, I'm not responsible for any of these things, but I might still care, are they performing well? Um, is there a problem? And so for all of these types of aspects, what is exposed to kind of you is yes, Azure's responsible, but what I can actually get out of this are things like metrics and different types of logs. And there's various services that are exposed and I can use these. I could send it to maybe another SIM system through a kind of event hub. I could just store them in a storage account. Um, I could put them in a log analytics service and then run more intelligent services on top to actually get meaningful insight into well, what do these mean. There are other services that will give me recommendations based on these to say, hey, make this bigger or shrink this or various types of different types of input. So although I'm not responsible, I may still want to kind of know. If you think about the whole racy, responsible, accountable, consulted, informed, I might still want to know about what's going on, if they're healthy, if there's a problem. And so all kind of these health alerts, I can surface up through metrics and logs. 
And my focus for today is really about IaaS, these infrastructure services where, hey, I'm basically getting a VM in the cloud. So the most basic thing you can think about, IaaS is really a, a VM in the cloud. Now, the ultimate goal, though, is there's, there's other layers. There's things like, for example, PaaS. So PaaS is platform as a service. And here the line really travels this way. I, I am responsible, green, for my app and my data. Azure is now responsible for the other pieces. Now, many of these are still built on virtual machines, and the cloud is not vaporware. <laughs> but I don't have to manage them. I'm not thinking about patching or backing up or protection or firewalls. It's done for me. What I get the ability to do is fun focus on my workload, my app, my, my data. And there are different types of paths. And again, it's not a focus for this. But often we'll think about different types of kind of PaaS service and we kind of move up through layers. So you can think about things like um, Azure Container Instances and Azure Kubernetes Service, which is the orchestrator. We think about things like, well, app service plans. We think about serverless. And we kind of go up in terms of the maturity because these could be functions. They could be logic apps. And the reason we're kind of moving up and why is it called serverless is for app services, um, for AKS, there were worker nodes that run your things. And what I pay for is essentially VMs. I pick the VM size and I'm paying for those. And then I run my work on them, but I'm paying at a per VM level, no matter how busy it is or isn't. With serverless, I'm not paying for a VM. I'm paying for kind of the cycles that it's using to do the work for that function, that logic app. These are normally triggered by something could be an event, uh, could be a schedule, could be a manual trigger. Could hook into things like event grid that's looking at other types of resource and then calls one of these things. In some ways, Azure Container Instances could almost be forwarded off as serverless because again, I'm not focusing on the size really of a VM. I'm just focusing on, hey, the size of this container instance and how long it's running for. But there are these other types of service available that ultimately if I can use one of those, there's less things I'm responsible for, less work I'm thinking about, and therefore it's more optimal for my company. And then kind of at the, the far end, there's SaaS. Now these are software as a service. Now this is not Azure. Uh, software as a service could be things like Microsoft 365, um, Dynamics 365. It delivers the complete business value. It provides the solution. PaaS provides me a platform on which I can run my own business application that provides the business value. SaaS is actually providing the business value. So Exchange Online, SharePoint Online, Dynamics, etc. And so while we're focusing here on the IaaS, as a company, generally I, I try and get as far this way as I can. If there's a SaaS solution, fantastic. Um, use it. If there's not, and I'm creating it new for my company, well, uh, can I write it using PaaS? Again, I'm not really in the business of wanting to manage operating systems and runtimes and middlewares. If there's a platform out there that I can just deploy my app onto, um, that, that's a better fit for me. So we're always kind of thinking about, well, what can I do over here um, to actually leverage this? So there are the layers. That's how we think about the services and how we think about Azure. But a, a key point, there's nothing magical about Azure. It really comes down to, well, there's capacity that's available in different regions that exposes various types of service, which is what we're kind of getting over to here. I, in the cloud, am never directly accessing storage or compute or networking or data centers or hypervisors. Instead, these services are exposed to me that I can then consume. So that's, that's kind of the point. So what exactly is Azure? How do I use Azure? What are these clouds? And I think we kind of start looking at it from kind of these layers um, going up. 
So I talked about, well, there's this capacity in Azure. And really, the way this boils down to and starts out is we can think about in Azure, we think about, well, there's the Azure cloud. And the reality is we start off with, we use and we deploy to a region. And a region is really defined as this two millisecond latency envelope. So inside that region, there are most likely multiple data centers. Those multiple data centers are connected. There are these kind of regional network gateway pairs that go and connect. And then when I deploy to a region, hey, my workload gets put onto one or more data centers within those data centers that make up the region. And I kind of drew these regional network gateways because fundamentally there is a massive uh, Microsoft network. There's this huge global network that these regional network gateways connect to, to connect to other regions, to connect to edge sites that then connect to ISPs, to connect to the internet, that connect to your maybe location for private connectivity. Now there are a lot of these regions, and if I quickly pull up the site, so I'll actually jump over. So this is the Microsoft kind of geography page, and here we can see these are all of the various regions. And if we zoom in a little bit, we can see well, that they're all over the world. There are many regions in the United States, in Canada, in Europe, in specific countries in Europe, in South Africa, in Brazil, um, in China, in India, in Australia, New Zealand, um, Korea, Japan, you kind of name it, there are Azure regions in all of these different countries. Now we talk about Azure as a cloud. So I drew kind of the idea that, hey, this is a particular region in this greater Azure cloud. And for 99.99% of us, that's what we're going to use. There's the Azure commercial cloud. There are actually some other clouds. These are Azure clouds, but they're based on certain sovereign locations. For example, there's a China cloud. And there's a German cloud. There's a government cloud. And there's even a, a top secret government cloud that they wrote a blog about. So I'm not sure the word top secret means what they think it means, um, but there's another cloud. We can see these. So once again, if I actually jump over super quick, if I just open up the portal, and one of the nice things, so I'm gonna use the Azure portal for a lot of this today. Obviously in a real production environment, we wanna be using infrastructure as code. If you wanna find out more about that, I have a whole masterclass lesson on that. But I'm gonna open up a cloud shell so this lets me kind of get easy PowerShell or kind of bash access so I can use the Azure PowerShell module or the AZ CLI. And what we can actually do from here, so I'm down here in the bottom, right? What I'm actually going to do is if I do a get AZ environment, you can see here the, the four clouds, it doesn't show top secret. But what we can see here is the regular kind of Azure cloud. That's the commercial cloud that we're going to use. But then we can also see kind of the China cloud, the US Gov cloud, and the German cloud. So those are kind of sovereign clouds. For example, to use the China cloud, you have to be in China in a Chinese company. German is all around the data sovereignty and the requirements there to do business in Germany. So it's managed by a German uh, company. China is operated by a Chinese partner. Obviously, US government is restricted to government entities or their partners. But for us, really, for the most part, we're gonna be using the commercial cloud. But if you were in one of those geographies, hey, that there are those sovereign clouds available. If you deal with the government, um, then you may get access to that gov cloud as well. But for the most part, we're thinking about, hey, these regions. And what you saw is when I showed all those different regions, actually we jump back to that, there are normally at least two of them in any geopolitical boundary. 
Now, Brazil was kind of the exception, but you can actually see they are building out a, a second um, region in Brazil. Because the idea is, I want to be able to have resiliency replication to another region, which are generally hundreds of miles apart, but keep my data in that same geopolitical boundary, i.e. the same country for data sovereignty requirements reasons. And so in all of these different locations, generally there's always at least two regions. Now, some services like Azure Storage and Azure Key Vault will actually use that paired region for a replica of the data. And you can actually go and find these. So we do pair the regions behind the scenes. So if I turn on things like just geo-redundant storage, um, it replicates to the paired region. For many other services, um, you can kind of pick where you want to replicate to. Now, if I think about what I drew a second ago, so a region is really made up of one or more data centers. And for as many regions as possible, Microsoft are introducing the concept of availability zones. And I can really think about an availability zone as having independent kind of calling, power, and communications. This enables me to have resiliency from a data center level problem. Because I can definitely think about, well, hey, look, there's another region over here, and others over there, and they're kind of connected. And if I deploy my services to this region and this region, well, if something bad happens to this big area like a natural disaster, well, then my services are over here. They're hundreds of miles away. So this natural disaster definitely shouldn't have impacted this one. But obviously, when I think about hundreds of miles, that maybe limits how I can replicate data. It would have to be asynchronous to not impact performance. So ideally, maybe there's constructs at a more local level to give me some resilience from different types of failure. And so availability zones are the idea that, hey, I'll see three availability zones in my subscription. Now, the key point here is what I'll see in my subscription, I see kind of an AZ1, AZ2, and AZ3. But that's not really written on the buildings. There is no AZ1, AZ2, AZ3. There might be lots of different buildings in this region. And what's really happening is at a subscription level, if I think about, hey, there are all of those different data centers, let's just say there's four within a particular region. And remember, each of these, the whole point of AZs is that independent calling, power, and communication. So if a problem impacts one of those data centers, it's not going to impact the others. And then I have a subscription. I have subscription number one. So in subscription number one, I would always see kind of an AZ1, AZ2, and AZ3. And it may map to that one. AZ1 is there. AZ2 is there. AZ3 is there. And then I get a different subscription. Then I have subscription two. And that will also see AZ1, 2, and 3. However, there's no correlation. This AZ1 could be that location. AZ2 could be that one. Uh, AZ3 may happen to be the same one. But there's no consistency between subscriptions. The point of availability zones is its isolation from the other availability zones. But there's no correlation between different subscriptions. Its goal is if, hey, it, I deploy services, so I put maybe a VM in terms of this subscriptions over here, here, and here, AZ1, 2, and 3 for sub 1. I know that any kind of data center level problem, let's say data center 2 goes kind of up in flames, it's not going to impact AZ1 and 3. There was a comms problem. So it gives me the ability to isolate so a blast radius, the other availability zone. So that's what, and I definitely want to use those. Now more and more regions are kind of getting those availability zones. If we actually go back and look at the picture, it actually does show us, if we scroll down this picture, we can see availability zones presence here, 
and it will show us, hey, based on the region, if it supports availability zones, and you're basically always gonna see three. There's never more than three exposed to a subscription. If it doesn't, it's telling me, hey, for example, in here, North Central US, it's saying, no, we don't support AZs. The closest one will be Central US. So that's why I can go and check and say, hey, well, can I use availability zones? Again, that's really something you want to use if you can. And when I use availability zones for my service, so when I, I use that construct, availability zones gives me a 99.99% SLA. So that's uh, kind of an important thing in terms of those constructs. Now, there, there's another construct that's getting less and less um, focus, and that's availability sets. Because I can think about, well, sure, I drew the region and there's different data centers in the region, but I could really think about, well, within each of those data centers, if we kind of exploded one of these out for a second, there's fundamentally racks of servers, racks and racks of servers. And in those racks of servers, there's lots of kind of servers. And I can really think about, well, yes, a data center is a unit of failure in a way so it can go wrong, but also a rack and a server is a unit of failure. Each rack has its own um, power, its own uh, network switches. So I can think of these as fault domains. And so there's this concept of, I think that fault domain zero, fault domain one, fault domain two, that I might wanna spread my workloads over different racks. And we could do that. So we had this idea of availability sets. And what I would do is I would create the availability set. So I just create an availability set and then I just put things in it. And Azure kind of round robins between the three fault domains. Now I can pick the number, but three is kind of the max for VMs and regular availability sets. And it would kind of round robin putting my workloads over different fault domains. And there's also within availability sets something called update domains. And there's generally between five and 20 when there's maintenance performed, it will only do one update domain at a time. So if I had five update domains, so I can think about, hey, there's fault domains, which are really kind of racks. And then there's update domains, which are subsets within that rack. And so I might have, let's say, three fault domains, but five update domains. And so when there's Azure updates rolling out on the nodes themselves, it would only pause a fifth if I have five at a time. If I had 20, well then it's only 5% um, at a time it would pause. So that's how it rolls out its updates. So availability sets are, are good. It gives me kind of blast radius at a rack level, but obviously availability zones are better because availability zones give me a blast radius of an entire data center. And so we're kind of seeing availability sets really de-emphasized. And in fact, what's very common now is a lot of times you'll see the idea of fault domain equals one. And that doesn't mean one fault domain, it means use as many as you can. So if you use virtual machine scale sets, which is the ability to automatically create lots of VMs from kind of a base image and configuration, which we're gonna cover, if I say fault domain equals one, it will actually try and spread over as many racks, more than three, as it can within any particular data center, i.e. availability zone. So this whole concept of availability sets and three maximum is kind of being pushed um, back as availability zones become more prevalent. And now we think about, hey, let's just try and spread out over many racks as possible. So again, we're always trying to isolate um, any kind of risk and impact of some independent failure. There is also the concept, I talked about proximity placement groups. If you think about availability zones and availability sets are about isolation and keeping things apart, well, sometimes I wanna keep things together. 
And so a proximity placement group, I create this proximity placement group thing. And then the first workload I put in that proximity placement group will pin it to a certain part of a physical location to try and keep things that are now added to that proximity placement group as close as possible. So I create a proximity placement group. Originally, it doesn't exist anywhere. Then I create the first resource and put it in, and it, maybe I picked AZ1. So now within AZ1, it will carve out a portion of the facility for that proximity placement group I created. And now everything else I add to that proximity placement group will be put within that kind of more constrained latency uh, envelope. You obviously have to be careful because the first resource controls where it's put. So generally, if I'm going to have a mix of different sizes and advanced types of workload, put the most advanced, biggest VM first, like an N series or an M, because that will make sure it gets created in a data center that has that type of workload. Then the more standard ones will be fine. And I can mix these things. I can obviously have a PPG um, with an AZ. AZ and availability sets are kind of you use one or the other, unless I cheat. I'm not going to go into that in this video, but I can kind of cheat if I use proximity placement groups. Um, never mix workloads in an availability set. An availability set is not looking at what's running. It's just blindly round robin distributing them between those three racks. So if I mixed my domain controllers and my databases and my IIS servers in the same availability set, through sheer bad luck, it might put oh, DC SQL app server, DC SQL app server. So I end up with all the same workloads on the same rack. So I create an availability set per unique workload, an availability set for my domain controllers, one for my SQL databases for this SQL cluster, one for this IIS app, one for a different IIS app to make sure they're always kind of spread out. So that's really the goal about that. So they're the key constructs. So no matter what I'm doing, VMs, Kubernetes, app services, doesn't matter. These key kind of isolation constructs are going to get used. The idea of regions, ideally availability zones if they're available in the region. And then these fault domains, I get to kind of select those things. So now let's start talking about actually the resources we want to use. And when I create Sync, I create it in a subscription. And that subscription has to have people with various rights and permissions to actually use those things. So before I start creating anything actually in Azure, the first thing we have to do is have an identity provider. And the identity provider in Azure is always going to be Azure AD. So this is Azure AD. And I can create users and groups directly in that Azure AD. Most of the time, if you had an existing Active Directory, you will populate this by actually replicating a synchronization using something called Azure AD Connect, which will now populate the user objects and groups and maybe machines into this Azure AD as well, which is the identity provider for Azure services, for Microsoft 365, for Dynamics 365, and many other services. So it does that synchronization. Again, there's different ways I can authenticate to Azure AD. Cloud authentication is the best, the most secure. That means I replicate a hash of the password hash to Azure AD, so I can authenticate directly to Azure AD. Then there are things like conditional access and MFA to really give me strong authorization, strong authentication with the Azure AD MFA, which I then use to get access to other resources. So yes, absolutely, Azure Cloud trusts Azure AD as its identity provider. So each subscription trusts a particular Azure AD tenant, your one. But also many other clouds. So yeah, there's, there's Microsoft one, so I can think out, well, Microsoft 365, Dynamics 365, they also use Azure AD as their identity provider. But there can be third party other clouds. So just general other SaaS solutions out there 
The whole point is I don't want different identities for my users. I want them to have one identity that I can use in the cloud through Microsoft services for other services. And so all these other kind of SaaS services can also trust Azure AD. So now I can add this one identity that is basically synchronized up to the cloud that can then be used for all these other things to get authorized to consume those services. And there are literally thousands of different third party SaaS services that are built into Azure AD that I can just kind of turn on and it will then enable me um, to use those. If there are objects that have to get created in the other cloud, there's something called Skim. I think it's a system for cross identity management or something. Um, it can go and create the objects there for me as well. But Azure AD is going to be the identity provider for Azure and many other things, but we're focused on Azure. So I have to have Azure AD. Now, if you're already using Office 365, you've got Azure AD already. Someone has already set this up for you. So this is where my accounts are that I'm actually going to use to get permissions and access to the resources I'm going to create. Now, I said we get a subscription, but there's actually uh, layers in between there. So if I think about, well, there's my Azure AD at the top, and that's for my tenants. There are many different tenants out there. I have my own tenant. And I can actually have this hierarchy called management groups. So there's always going to be kind of this root that sits directly under the Azure AD. So now I'm thinking about my management groups. And I can have a hierarchy of these. So management group there, here. I can have this complete hierarchy of management groups to maybe meet my various kind of business requirements. Now, what are those requirements? Why do I have these management group things? When I use the cloud, um, there, there's a big shift in process. If we go all the way back to this idea of on-prem, if I was a user, and so I'm the user, and I want to consume some of that capacity, I want a VM. Well, I would probably have to go and make some request. Maybe it's an email, maybe it's a ticket, something else to an admin. Let's say they've got glasses and they've got hair, so definitely not me. And the admin would look at that request, check it meets requirements, check maybe as a project I've got enough capacity allowed, allocated to me, and then they would actually go and do the provisioning. Well, that doesn't work in the cloud. In the cloud, we don't have this admin sitting in between. A huge part of the cloud is this whole idea of kind of self-service. And it's not just me manually going to a portal or manually running a template. A huge thing we're going to see is the whole idea of kind of DevOps and these CI, CD pipelines that automatically go and provision the resources, provision our app, and they might do it daily, and it's constantly ongoing. So there's no way I can have this user in the middle of the process. But this user did an important point. They checked, really, they were our governance checkpoint. They were the guardrails for our company because they checked, well, are we meeting our policy requirements? Um, they set up the right kind of permissions. They checked, well, are you using the right amount of money? So they were checking budgets. So they were doing all of those kind of things. And even if I move to this self-service cloud world, I still need those things. And so the reason we have these kind of constructs here is I still have the requirement that I need to be able to do policy. I still need to be able to do role-based access control, give different people different permissions to different scopes, or different sets of objects. And I still need to be able to do budget. And there are constructs in Azure for each of these things. And as you probably guessed already, well, I can apply these at management group levels. And they get inherited down. So anything I set here, is inherited. So I could set it at a fairly high level, it'll get inherited down to all of the child management groups. 
And then within a management group, what we ultimately create is that subscription. And it's in that subscription that yes, so we can apply policy and RBAC at kind of all these different management group levels. We can also apply it at a subscription level. Now within that subscription, when I want to create resources, uh, what we actually do is we create something called a resource group. And again, as you've probably guessed already, I can set these things at the resource group as well. And then it's finally within the resource group where I actually go and create my resources. So I create this VM and another VM and I create a storage account and I create a website. I don't know what that is. It's a very bad planet. And the reason we group things in the resource groups is they have a common life cycle. They're created together, they run together, they're going to get deprovisioned ultimately together. They're part of maybe the same application. And so most likely we're going to have the same people want the same permissions, the RBAC. We're going to have them be similar policies, maybe a certain budget for that project. Within a subscription, I can have lots of resource groups. A resource group is not a boundary of communication. So I could absolutely have kind of resource over here. Maybe I've got networks in this resource group that these VMs could absolutely use and connect to. So the whole point is we have this hierarchy. So we have the management groups that are used for really governance organization. So I can apply different policies, RBAC budgets. I can also do that at subscription, resource group. And the reality is even at a per resource level, I can actually apply policy and RBAC. Generally we don't, it, it's too convoluted. Um, really resource group is as humans, as low as we'll go. Uh, sometimes certain automations, they might do an RBAC or uh, policy at an individual resource level. We typically will not. So we have all these different constructs. And again, the point is so the RBAC is a set of permissions I can perform, actions I can perform at a certain scope. Management group, um, subscription, resource group, or even individual resource. And under any particular management group, I can have multiple subscriptions. So fundamentally, our building block is going to be when we create stuff, we create it inside a subscription. That's really how we're going to get started. So the, the governance is a, is a key part. Now, there are many other elements to governance. I'm not going to go into detail. Again, in the masterclass, there's a whole video on governance. Because I have use of tags, I have naming, that there are many other elements to that I have to really think about. One other thing you can kind of do is if I think about, well, policy and role-based access control and creating resources and creating resource groups, very commonly you'll kind of see these things bundled up together into something called a blueprint. A blueprint is something I can stamp down on a subscription to maybe lay down an initial configuration. So a blueprint contains policies and RBAC. Also, I can define resource groups and ARM template deployments. An ARM template is just a way to create resources in a declarative form. So it will create hey, these VMs and these storage accounts. So there's other ways I can actually create things and blueprints bring these things together as a way to stamp down an initial configuration and you can have different locking. I can make it read only. I can make it so you can't, you can change it, but you can't delete it. Or, hey, it's an initial state, but go nuts, delete it if you want to. I'm just putting down an initial state to help you. So we don't want to create anything. Um, these are the, the constructs. I need identity. I need somewhere to create things. What are the actual resources I can create? So if I think back, to kind of all these different kind of layers, we often think about well, a virtual machine. And really a virtual machine is just this, this unit of compute with other um, configuration. So if we think we have a server, so there is a physical server in those racks, in those data centers. Now that physical server has attributes. It has resources. This physical server has certain amounts of CPU. It has certain amounts of memory. 
it has certain network connectivity, it has certain amounts of storage locally, and it has certain amounts of remote connectivity. It can support a certain amount of throughput. In Azure, they probably separate out the storage and the regular network communications to uh, different network devices. So it has a certain amount of throughput it can support for storage. It might have specialized. It might have GPUs. So there might be kind of these special configurations where, hey, maybe it's got GPUs. It's got special types of maybe NVMe local storage. Maybe it's got RDMA network. Uh, InfiniBand connectors and many other different things. But essentially we have servers with different configurations, different SKUs of maybe more memory to CPU, maybe more throughput. And then I'm going to create a VM. And fundamentally, my VM is taking a certain portion of those things. My VM is going to have itself, well, it's going to have a certain amount of virtual CPUs. It's going to have a certain amount of memory. It's going to have a certain amount of network connectivity. It's going to have a certain amount of storage in terms of maybe number of disks, maybe in terms of IOPS, and in terms of throughput. Remember, IOPS and throughput are not the same thing. IOPS is the number of input-output operations I can perform per second. And then based on the size of the operation, that's the throughput. So if I was doing an operation of 1K and I did 1,000 of them, well, that's 1,000K. That would be my throughput. But if the operation was 8K, it's still 1,000 operations, but now the throughput is 8,000K. Um, so they are kind of these, these different numbers. And also, there's a certain amount of local storage I'm going to consume. And what we end up with is lots of different VM series and size. I cannot just say, hey, give me a VM with three virtual CPUs and 2.2 gigabytes of memory and 12 IOPS. It's, it's T-shirts, small, medium, large. But just like T-shirts, there's sort of regular fit, there's athletic fit, there's loose fit, because my different workloads will have different skews in terms of what it cares. Maybe it's more memory centric or CPU centric or storage centric or network centric. Maybe they need to be really, really big. And so what we have, if we look at the virtual machine sizes, what we can see here is, well, just like I said, there's different types. So there's ones that are just general purpose. It's the fairly balanced, you can see here, fairly balanced ratio of CPU to memory. Then we have ones that are more compute optimized, so it's a higher CPU to memory kind of ratio. We have ones that are memory optimized, so a higher memory to kind of CPU ratio. We have the storage optimized, so high throughput, high IOPS. We have ones that have GPUs, these NVIDIA CUDA cards and others, ones that have RDMA network adapters. So we have all these different types actually available to us, and we basically select based on what we need. Hey, my workload, maybe it's a database. Well, my database is actually super memory focused. So we'd look at, well, what are the memory optimized virtual machines? And then within the memory optimized, there are different types. D, E, M, there were constrained uh, versions. Now you'll notice sometimes you'll see kind of this S variant. In fact, most of the time you'll see this. There's a D, S, and just a D. The S means it's allowed to use the premium storage um, types of disk that are available, the premium SSD, the ultra disks. You'll also see sometimes there's a version. So here you can see where there's a V2, um, here there's kind of this V4, there's a V3. Because if you think about it, over time, hardware changes, hardware gets more powerful. But I want to make sure there's consistency if I create a machine today and I create one tomorrow. And so these different versions are really focused around this Azure compute units. 
So the way we measure the CPU in Azure is there's this ACU score, and it's all relative to the A1. Kind of the first Azure virtual machine has a score of 100. And then we can see the different generations. So here the V2 of the D series is higher than the V1. It's over here. We can see the V3 of the D series is lower, which makes no sense until you notice the vCPU to core ratio is 2 to 1. So this introduced hyperthreading. So each thread, this virtual CPU, is slightly lower performance because now I get two of them. So that's why the number goes down, but the reality is now I have more of them um, to actually work with. So this is how I can actually track what is the power of the actual CPUs I'm getting. I look at the Azure Compute Unit. But also when you actually look at the virtual machines themselves, it tells you the type of processors they're running. So it tells you the exact, hey, Intel ZM Platinum 827, blah, 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 blah. So we can go and get all of the details of what that actual CPU is. And then for any of these, we'll just pick one, there are different sizes. So within the series, i.e. the EV4, there's an E2, an E4, an E8, E16, 20, 32, 48. And as you can see, the resources scale linearly. The more CPUs, the more memory, the more temp storage, the more number of data disks, the more temp storage throughput I have, the max number of NICs, the network performance, all scale linearly as I go up in size of the virtual machine. Because if you think about it logically, I'm getting a certain portion of the physical node. So they have to kind of scale linearly. If I'm using up more CPU, well, I'm using up more of the, now I'm using 50% of that box's overall resources, so I get 50% of its memory network storage as well. So it's going to scale linearly. Now, they do do some mixing on the back end to maximize the overall um, usage. But by and large, what they're doing is they have different stamps of clusters of identical hardware that are more memory skewed or CPU skewed or have their higher throughput for storage or network, have the NVIDIA GPUs, etc. So I go and pick a certain series based on my workload. So I have to understand what are the requirements of my workload. Is it more memory or CPU or storage or network? I need GPUs, I need RDMA for high performance computing. And then how much do I need? That will drive the series and size that I ultimately select and provision. I can change it. I can shut down the VM, change its size, and then start it again. So it's not like in the real world where I buy a server and if I make a mistake, I'm stuck. I can very easily change the size of my virtual machine and then just start it again. So I do have some flexibility there. It's not like the, the huge painful mistake. Now you may have noticed that we had those kind of constrained um, virtual CPU SKUs. The point of those is maybe I need those massive amounts of memory. And along with that comes a certain number of CPUs because again, it has to linearly scale. Even the memory optimized SKUs where I get more memory per CPU ratio, if I go to a really high amount of memory, I still get quite a lot of CPUs. Maybe I don't want those CPUs. And you might think, why, why would I not want them? Imagine I'm paying licensing on a per CPU basis, a database product, for example, and I just need the memory. I need a massive amount of memory, but it really doesn't need many CPUs. And if I only need four CPUs, but it gives me 16, I have to pay for 16 licenses of the software. So the point of the CPU constrained versions, if we go and look here, is what they actually do is, now you're still paying for the full size of the VM, but essentially you can see here it's hiding them. So the M8, for example, 4MS, I'll only see four virtual CPUs. Everything else is the same as the M8 MS, but it's hiding the other CPU. So I would only have to pay for four CPUs of the licensing. So if we looked at what is the M8 MS, 
So the M8 MS normally has eight virtual CPUs. So it's hiding a portion of them so I don't have to pay for eight virtual CPUs. I only have to pay for four. Or I could do the M8 II and just pay for two virtual CPUs. So that's really the point of those. Now remember, these virtual machines, everything here um, is multi-tenant. When I get my virtual machine, that, that's my virtual machine. Well, another person from a different tenant, their virtual machine might be on that same box. Now, there's huge security, there's isolation of the hypervisor, the network, that they can't see each other because it's on the same box. If you need your own box, there's really two approaches to this. Some of them, actually the size of the virtual machine takes up the whole box. See, if I, if I take one of these VMs that is the size of the box, there's only one VM on that box. I still want it to be a VM, not bare metal, because being a VM, gets me that ability to use all of the various features, the snapshots, the types of disk, all the extensions, the ARM deployment. I still want to be a VM. I don't want to be bare metal. Hypervisor gives me that abstraction from the physical hardware, so the mobility, but no one else is on it. There's also something called dedicated host. So if I'm maybe running a certain type of workload that I'm not allowed, for maybe regulatory reasons, to be on the same box as someone else, it can only be my stuff on the box, then there's dedicated host. So dedicated host, I basically pay for the host and I can buy multiple dedicated hosts and I can put them in something called a host group. So this is all dedicated. And then I can put them into a host group. And then when I create my VM, I can say, hey, create my VM in this host group and it will automatically place it. Now, when I buy a dedicated host, it's of a certain type. So it's a D series or an E series or, or something else. And I can only put Ds on the D series dedicated host or Es on an E series dedicated host. I can create them of different sizes. Basically, I, I can fill it up, um, up to the capacity of the host. So if I, don't want to share, I can't share the physical host because of regulatory reasons. There is dedicated uh, options where I get my own host. It's still Azure, everything else is the same. It's just, it's not multi-tenant in terms of who gets put on that box. It's only my stuff will get put on that box. And again, the host groups make it easier for me to deploy. I don't have to think about, we'll put this VM on this host, this one here. Uh, host group kind of abstracts that away for me. I can use that with things like virtual machine scale sets as well. The other kind of special, so again, we have dedicated, we have isolated, because if the VM takes up the whole size, it's an isolated. Normally you just, you, you pay for the resource, i.e. it's not over-provisioned. I get two virtual CPUs. If I'm running at 1% or 100%, I'm paying the same thing. There is also the B series, so that's a B. And the B stands for burstable. So with the B series, what I actually get is I get a certain amount of the number of virtual CPUs allocated. Let's say it's 20%. So I get this provisioned, hey, you can consume 20%. Now, if what I'm actually using is less, I start accruing credit. So just like your cell phone plan that you can roll when it's over, if I'm using less, whatever that less is, uh, I start to accrue a certain amount of credit. And what it lets me do, the reason it's called burstable, is if I suddenly get a busy requirement, I can burst above that if I have some kind of peak. And when I burst up, I obviously start using my credit and then I can start accruing it again. So that's the burstable. And if we go and look at that, we can actually see, if we go and look at the G series, general purpose, B series burstable, it talks about the idea that, hey, I can pick how many virtual CPUs I want. I get a base performance. If we pick the B1, I get a base performance of 10%. I can burst to 100%. It does give you some credits initially, 
and then you can accrue is saying how you can bank six per hour maximum you can bank is 144 so then i could burst up and use more so the b series is nice that they're cheaper and it still lets me do that kind of bursting on occasion so that's another option there and notice those isolated sizes i talked about earlier on so these are the ones that are just simply they're so big it takes up the entire box so if i create one of these isolated virtual machines I'm not sharing with anyone else. It's just because I'm, I'm taking up the whole box. Now, one of the things often you want to try and work out is, well, what is this actually going to cost me? So there is a pricing calculator. And what I can do in this calculator, let's just close this down, is I can actually go in and say, hey, I want to work out the price for a virtual machine. And then I could say, well, hey, um, is it Windows? Is it Linux? You'll notice the Linux is cheaper. Why is that? Well, because with the Windows, it includes the Windows Server license. Now, if you had something like Azure Hybrid Benefit, i.e. you have the license already, I can tell it that. You can see here the price for the Windows dropped if I turn it back to license, the total sum over here on the right, and the Windows license has a value. When I say Azure Hybrid Benefit, it drops down. But I can go and work out, well, what size do I need? Obviously, the bigger it is, the more I'm going to pay. And the whole point of the cloud is on-premises, they run 24-7. In the cloud, they run for when you need it. So on-premises, we often think about for our workloads, we just have these big virtual machines that runs the work and it's running 24 7. even if the requirements on it um, are variable it's just always there because we've got the physical box why wouldn't we in the cloud we pay per second now it's not practical to keep making it um, sort of vertical scale I don't want to think about well, adding CPUs, removing CPUs. That's not practical. So in the cloud, we think about scaling out and in vertical, sorry, horizontal. So I'll have more smaller ones that I can kind of stop and stop. So if I have kind of a, a busy time, then sure, we have all of them running. But if I get quieter, well then, we'll stop those ones, delete them. If I get busier again, well it can reprovision them, or maybe even add more. They're smaller units, it's costing me the same at the peak time as this one big box to have maybe eight small ones, but when it's quieter, I can delete them and therefore save money. So we don't do things the same way as we think about with kind of on-prem. We want to scale kind of out and in rather than up and down. Up and down is, is not practical for most things. Now, it does require the app to support multi-instances. And we need some kind of triggers to create and delete the instances so we stop paying for them. But just remember in the cloud, absolutely, we want to be scaling. We pay per second. I don't want resources sitting there that are bigger than they need to be or more than I need to have. We want to scale the things because we pay based on what we're actually using. That's one of the huge opportunities for the cloud to actually save money is because it is consumption-based. We pay for what we're consuming. So when I go through these calculators, it's super important to really think about, well, would I, maybe I need four of them. However, not all four would be running all of the time. Maybe some of them, and I'd have to break this out into separate sort of settings but maybe some of them would run for two hours all the time but then some of them would only run for I don't know half the time so I'll actually go through and work these things out and I can change it over time the beautiful thing about again consumption basis if I'm off on my numbers if I'm auto scaling it will create and delete them based on the actual requirements not based on some hard number I've actually put in there are things like um, 
reserved instances, which is where, hey, I know absolutely, I'm always gonna have, if I think about those variations, even in my most quiet time, I know the minimum I'm ever gonna have is four, let's say. And then maybe there's some others that will kind of change over time. Well, with reserved instances, I can kind of do this one year or three years, and it's not just CP, uh, virtual machines, I can do it for other types of resource as well. I can say, hey, look, I'm gonna buy four, let's just say, for example, VMs for a year or three years, and you get a big discount because it helps Azure in terms of their capacity planning. So you get this big discount. The key point here is though, if you ever drop these down to two, you'd still be paying for four. It's like doing a, a room reservation at a hotel and you get a huge discount if you book it for a month. If you don't stay in that hotel room for two nights out of the month, you're still paying for those two nights. And so the reserved instances, the point is, hey, I know I have this base level workload that I'm always gonna have running, and I know I'm gonna have it. Well, I can do these reserved instances, and it's gonna give you a big discount. So if I know, hey, I've got this certain amount I'm always gonna use, I can say, hey, I wanna do a one year reserve, so you get a 32% discount, or a three year reserve, so I get a 57% discount. So when you start combining things like the reserved instances, and the Azure Hybrid Benefit, things can start to get really, really cheap. But again, the key point here is, you'd have to balance this. Um, if you make it too big and then you're not using them, you're kind of wasting money. However, because of the size of the discount, it may still be cheaper to say minimum of four, even if sometimes I drop to three, if it's not for that long, I still might be saving money overall. So there's a little bit of kind of look at the math, um, to work out what the right number is for when I do those reserved instances on all the different types of resource available in Azure. And obviously, as you saw, this is Windows Linux. There's a huge number of Linux distributions supported. Um, Microsoft actually is a big contributor now to kind of that open source community. A lot of the Azure components are built in or easily available. There's a huge number of them available in the Azure kind of marketplace when I create a virtual machine. So if I actually jump over, and if we go to actually create a VM, so I'm just going to look at my virtual machines, and I'll do add VM. What we'll actually see is that, I mean, there's images built in. So there's ones around Ubuntu, Red Hat, SUSE, CentOS, Debian, Oracle Linux. Then, of course, Windows Server, Windows Client, because so I can have things like Windows Virtual Desktop, all of these available or I can just kind of bring my own. Now you'll notice this Gen 1. Most of the things in Azure are Gen 1, either BIOS based, but there is a Gen 2 um, for the UEFI. And you'll see also when I create those virtual machines, here I can pick, hey, well this only gives me availability set, because I'm picking West US. If I pick West US 2, well they support availability zones, whereas West US 1 doesn't. Notice I can pick availability zone or I can pick availability set, but I can't pick both. So I can pick one or the other. And again, we see one, two, and three. A different subscription, remember, would see something completely different. So when I create a VM, hey, I pick the region, and then based on the region, if it supports availability zones, I could deploy it to availability zone or availability set or none of them. And I, I should have kind of said availability sex gives you kind of a 99.95% SLA. So when we talked about those um, SLAs earlier on, I kind of drew out the idea that, hey, if I use those availability zones, you get that 99.99. If I use those availability sets, I get an SLA of 99.95%. So it's a, it's a lower SLA, which really makes sense because the blast radius. So availability sets, okay, it's, uh, it's now all within one data center, so it's harder to give you uh, as higher SLA. Different buildings, it's easier to give that resilience. And obviously, both of those are multiple. I need multiple virtual machines to be able to spread over racks, to spread over availability zones. There are SLAs for single instance virtual machines. So if I have a certain workload, where it is just one of them, 
and it's just sitting on kind of this single box, um, the SLA will actually vary depending on the types of disks it's using. So if I have just a single VM, if it's using premium storage, so say premium SSD, so it's really the storage that drives off that kind of that, how quickly things can get spun up and resolved, well then I get a 99, so a three nines SLA. If I use a standard SSD, then you get a 99.5, SLA. If you use a standard hard disk drive, you get a 95% SLA. And these are all documented. You can go to the Microsoft documentation and it walks through uh, the details of those SLAs. As you can see here, it talks about Halo availability zones. Well, great, you get 99.9. .9. Availability sets, 99.95. Using a premium or ultra disk, 99.9. .9. Standard, 99.5. A standard hard disk drive, 95%. So it kind of goes through um, those different options for you. So just uh, jumped over there for a second. But that's kind of the basics around, hey, uh, when I create a VM, I, I've got different the sizes based on the size. It impacts the cost and the different capabilities that I actually have available to me. So that, that's really the compute side of things. Now, beyond the compute, we talked about the scale. So I can scale out in with dedicated hosts. So a VM... Fundamentally, what is, and we came back to this, what is the virtual machine? The virtual machine really is just a, a set of hardware configuration. But what's, what is its state? Well, the state is its storage. So I think about, well, yeah, there's this virtual machine. But what really makes up its long-term kind of identity is its storage. So if I think about a VM, yes, it has a certain amount of resource, but it's also, hey, we have an OS disk, and we may optionally have various types of data disks. So when we think about saving costs in Azure, if I deprovision a virtual machine, it means, hey, this VM is no longer provisioned and running on a host, but it doesn't delete its disks. It doesn't delete that definition, the metadata. So this VM is this resource. It doesn't delete that metadata. So I can just start it again. It would reprovision it on another host. It would connect its OS and data disks to it, and I'm exactly back where I was. But I've stopped paying for the compute charge. So if I deprovision it, I stop paying for the dollars for the compute, but I would still be paying for the dollars for the actual disks. Those I don't want to delete, or I'd lose its state. So I always have kind of those options there in terms of how I handle my various resources. When you're playing around and you're learning these things, make sure you shut down virtual machines when you're not using them. If I'm not using it overnight, shut it down. Now, when I say shut it down, you have to shut it down from the Azure perspective. If you just log into the VM and do shutdown, but it doesn't deprovision it from a host. It's still provisioned on that host. I'm still paying for it. I have to deprovision. I have to shut it down from the portal, um, through PowerShell, through CLI. Then it will actually shut it down, deprovision it, remove it from the host. It's not there anymore. And I stop paying for the compute. Again, I'm still going to pay for the disk. So, once again, when I finish playing with it completely, make sure you delete everything. Delete the VM, delete the disks. And the best way to make sure you don't miss anything is remember these idea of the resource groups. So when I'm working on a certain project, maybe I'm doing a certain lab, create a resource group for the lab. Hey, lab one, there's the VM, there's its disks, there's its IP addresses, there's its network interface cards. When I'm done, delete the resource group. It will delete the VM, the disks, everything, so I'm not leaving things around that I'm paying money for. So it's kind of a super important point. 
So we have the virtual machine, certain size, has certain resources. That's this fundamental building block. The virtual machine is, yes, I could just use it on its own. I could create a, a number of them over different AZs, availability sets, proximity placement groups if I want them close together. But if I'm doing this scaling thing, that's a fairly painful thing to try and do myself. I could write something, I could use Azure Automation, I could use functions, I could trigger based on, hey, metrics, if it's not this busy over a certain duration, stop some or create them. But I really think about the virtual machine, this VM, as a building block. So yes, this virtual machine is great, but then I can think about things like, well, virtual machine scale sets. A virtual machine scale set is simply a configuration of the virtual machine, kind of in a base image. And then also, we have kind of attributes around scale. So if a virtual machine has a configuration and an image that it's running, a VMSS kind of points to a certain VM image and configuration. I can do scale, which could be based on kind of a schedule. It could be based on some kind of metric, i.e. CPU or Q depth above, below. It could be manual and it will automatically create and delete these based on those things. So that virtual machine is a building block that gets used by richer things. And then virtual machine scale sets are used by things like AKS, Azure Kubernetes Service for its workers. AKS for its workers, well, it actually points to a virtual machine scale set, then it adds the various Kubernetes, Kubelet, etc., that it needs to do its job and run the pods these things all build together. Uh, app service plans use virtual machines to run its apps on top of. So the virtual machine, when you start to understand VMs and the sizes and those concepts, it's not just for VMs. Many of the other things actually build on top of all these constructs. So again, things like app services, they use virtual machines, like pick a VM size series. So understanding these constructs is important. Windows Virtual Desktop. Hey, it sits on top of virtual machines. Many, many services leverage those virtual machines underneath. Even the PaaS, the database services, often you'll see I'm picking certain VM sizes because things don't really run in vaporware. They're really running on a VM behind the scenes. Okay, so I've probably spent way more time than I should have done just on the virtual machine size, but it's important to understand what a VM is. It's a certain set of resources with various ratios that you pick based on your workload, and then it, its state is in these disks. But where are those disks? What are those disks? So I drew this picture of kind of this VM on a node. So let's focus back on that for a second. So if I really think again about that node, that node has all those resources, and I did say, hey, it has a certain amount of local storage. And then I create my virtual machine. Now, I don't want to put my OS disk, for the most part, um, on here. Because remember, we don't really consider any physical piece of hardware as super resilient. It could fail. So this isn't really considered durable. It should be fine. But if I'd stopped my virtual machine and then started it again, I deprovisioned, stopped paying and started, it would probably get provisioned on a different host. So anything on this disk would be lost. If the node crashed, I'm gonna lose anything on the disk. And so what we have is we have Azure storage. And Azure storage at minimum is something called LRS, locally redundant storage. So anything I write on there, there is always three copies of my data. So I don't have to think about mirroring my disk or anything like that. It's always three copies within that storage cluster. Now, in the past, we would have to think about things like, well, we create a storage account, and then we create a page blob. And a page blob gives us very good random access to the pages that make up that binary large object. But there was a certain maximum number of operations per storage account, 
And the disk wasn't really a real thing. It wasn't a first class Azure resource. And so Microsoft essentially abstracted away the storage account. It's still there. But what we focus on is something called a managed disk. And so we actually now create a managed disk. And the first one we're going to have is the operating system. So be it Windows or Linux, we're going to map to a disk. Now, for pretty much all VMs, there are a few that don't have it. Um, it's like the DV4, the DSV4, don't have a temporary drive, but most do. They also get a portion of this local disk, and that's kind of this temp area. So it gets that mapped to it as well. So for Windows, this is by default D. For Windows, this would be default C. Obviously, Linux, um, this is kind of the slash mount, the temporary area. So we have this durable disk for the operating system. So even if something happened to this node, if we deprovisioned it, the disk is still there. Again, there's three copies of everything within that cluster. I can restart it, or if this dies, it gets reprovisioned. It can just reconnect it, but I would have lost everything on the temp drive. The temp drive, there's even a data loss warning file on that disk to say, hey, don't put your data on here. Um, I, I'm not durable. You're going to lose stuff if you put it on here. And I can also add additional disks. I can add one or more data disks as well, which again will be E, F, whatever I want to do. Remember, you never have to do mirroring uh, or RAID. Each of these is three copies of the data. I might stripe because maybe I want more IOPS or throughput for a particular volume. I'm never going to do redundancy. It's pointless. There's already three copies. We do redundancy with RAID because an, an individual physical disk uh, can fail and we'd lose the content. Well, think of each of these disks essentially as three copies of the disk. You're not going to lose the disk, so you don't have to waste space doing mirroring or um, striping with parity. It's not going to get me anything, so we don't do that. So I can add additional disks. Now, technically, I could still use the old unmanaged disks, but there's really not a reason to. Uh, I guess if I was doing the unmanaged regular hard disk drive, I only pay for the data I write but I lose all the benefits of the snapshotting, the images. So you're going to focus on managed disks. And what I'm going to have is there's different types of these managed disks. Now, I guess I should say, I said the OS is always on this durable storage. There may be times I have virtual machines that are stateless. They're tin soldiers. I don't care about them. So. There are scenarios where I can actually create the OS on this ephemeral, they call it ephemeral temporary, non-durable cache or temp area. So there's a certain amount of cache allocated per VM for caching, then there's this certain amount of temporary storage. So it is possible if I have completely stateless, I don't care if I lost that VM, it's just doing a certain workload but it has no stateless important. I can actually say, hey, create the OS on this temporary area it would provision faster, it will have a lower latency because it, it's local storage. So you can create ephemeral storage if you want. A lot of times in virtual machine scale sets, that might be something I need because those virtual machine scale set instances have no state. I just want to provision them as quick as possible and I save money because I'm not paying for this managed disk anymore. So you can have ephemeral storage if you want to, it's an option. But most of the time, if it is a state you care about, I have these managed disks. And there are different types of managed disk. I can think about, well, there's standard hard disk drive, which is really just kind of test dev. And there's standard SSD. Then there's premium SSD. And then there's ultra disk. Ultra, wonderful, super duper. All of these top three, I can think about the capacity, the IOPS, and the throughput scale linearly. I, as it gets bigger, I get more IOPS and I get more throughput. It's this consistent line across all of them. 
if we actually go and look at the types of disks we have available to us, here, ignore the fact that this is Linux, it's just this particular page I picked. But here we can see Halox standard hard disk drives. You can see you get a certain performance. Now, the IOPS are low on the bottom end, and notice it says up to. So both standard hard disk drive and standard SSD, it says up to. So that's the limit, but it's not provisioned. It's not guaranteed I will get that many. But what you can see is as the disk gets bigger, over here, for example, you start to get higher throughput and higher IOPS. If I look at the premium SSD, it's a much better kind of picture. Well, one, it now says provisioned, i.e. I am guaranteed with premium to get that number of IOPS. I am guaranteed with premium to get that throughput. Whereas with the standard offerings, it's a maximum, but I'm not guaranteed to get it. That's why really with premium and above, you consider those for production purposes. So you'll see here, well, they, they kind of go up. The bigger the disk, the more IOPS, the more provision throughput. Now, one of the nice things we actually get with the smaller premium disks you can see here is we do actually get a bursting capability. So what we can have here is, hey, there's a certain amount of guaranteed IOPS and throughput for those disks, but for limited amounts of time, it can actually burst up to a higher IOPS, a higher throughput for that limited time window. And you start off with a bucket of that higher IOPS and throughput, and then you can use it up, and then I can accrue it again if I'm using less than kind of that provisioned amount. So that bursting is becoming more and more popular as a means that, hey, I, I need this high IOPS and throughput, but for a fairly small time, don't make me buy this massive disk for when I, I really only need it for these burst scenarios, maybe a log on storm at the start of the day or something else. It's only for the smaller disks because the idea is the bigger premium disks, they already have high numbers, you shouldn't need to burst beyond those. Now, the other nice thing I can actually do is for the premium disks, yes, it's linear. Uh, based on the capacity, I get more IOPS and more throughput. But imagine I'm running premium, and I actually need a higher sustained IOPS and throughput for a certain amount of time, but then I want to drop back down again. Now, that would normally mean I'd have to make the disk bigger, and then I've got to somehow work out how to shrink it, which can be a fairly painful exercise. So what I can actually do with premium SSDs, you can separate the performance and the capacity. It's pretty easier to see. So if I jump over for a second, I'm actually just gonna go and look at my subscription. And if I look at my disks, now the disk has to be either detached from a VM or the VM deprovision. So I'll find one where I'm detached. So I've got premium SSD. And notice I have size and performance. So this is my size, 32, Gibby bytes, and I get a certain amount of provisioned IOPS and throughput. What I could do is I could change it to a different performance tier. This will not resize the disk, but it will essentially give me the performance of the bigger disk once I've done the resize. I would then run, so it's not resizing it, so I don't have to mess around in the future. When I'm done with that higher performance, I can then just shrink it back down to its regular performance, and I'm done. So for those premium disks, I can change the performance without having to resize it. So that's kind of the big deal now with those performance tiers. Hey, there's some window, and I could automate this, I could script it. Maybe I do have some bigger workload running nightly, a batch file, I wanna up its performance for an hour, and then shrink it back down. And maybe it's a bigger disk, so the uh, that burst is not available, or the burst is just not enough. I can actually completely change the performance characteristics of the disk without having to actually resize and then try and shrink it again. And so when I create my VMs, I can I pick the type of disk I want for the OS, and I can pick different types for the data disks. Again, if I want to use kind of these premiums or above, 
I have to do the S variant for the virtual machine. So the DS, the ES. They're the only ones that can use the premium or above types of disc. Ultra is special. So with Ultra, it actually kind of, if you can think about it, it has three different dials for kind of the capacity, the IOPS, and the throughput. And I can change them dynamically whenever I want. So I don't have to deprovision. So I can tweak and I, I pay for what each of the dials is kind of set to. So once I hit a certain capacity, I think maybe it's a terabyte, we can check. Then I can pick whatever IOPS or throughput up to like 160,000 IOPS, so it's massive. So if we go back and actually look, if we look at the ultra disk numbers, we can see the performance. So here we go. So once I hit, here we go, one terabyte in size here, I can now set these maximum numbers. So my size can continue up to like 64 terabytes, but even at one terabyte, I could have 160,000 IOPS or 2,000 megabytes per second. So I can tweak those numbers kind of individually, and it shows me all where these are available and how I can actually use those things. And so that the pricing is based actually on those. So if we look at billing, so there's a certain reservation. So if I create an ultra disk and don't connect it to anything, there's, there's kind of like a penalty for actually doing that. And for the VM, so there's VMs that are capable of connecting to ultra disks. So if I don't actually connect it to an ultra disk, um, there's a penalty for that. I pay this reservation fee. But if we look at the actual pricing details, we can see, hey, premium is just this fairly standard sizing based on the size of the disk. You pay more money the bigger the disk. But when I get to Ultra, well, I pay for the different configurations. You have kind of the base IOPS kind of throughput things, but then I pay based on the provisioned IOPS, the disk capacity, the provisioned throughput, and then again, this virtual CPU reservation charge if you don't actually connect it um, to an Ultra Disk if it's a Ultra Disk compatibility set on the VM. So I independently Dependently can tweak those dials um, based on what I actually need. So again, depending on the size of the disk, I can go up to these various numbers and I separately pay for whatever dials I set to based on the size, the capacity, the IOPS and the throughput. And there are some rules about how often I can kind of change those things and you can kind of read documentation, but fundamentally they're, they're separate dials that I can change. So Ultra Disk is super useful. I can go up to those massive, a single disk, 160,000 IOPS. Um, now, when I, I think about the storage, there's a number of aspects to this. Firstly, normally there's caching. So on the OS, by default, it's gonna be read, write, caching, which is normally what you want. For each data disk, I can set, do I want just maybe read caching, or do I want read write, do I want nothing? Like on a database, it's very common, maybe you wouldn't have any caching. Active Directory Domain Controller Database, um, I, I wouldn't have caching on that. Remember, I don't put data on the OS disk. Create a data disk, put data on the data disk, never put data on the temporary drive, it's temporary, you're gonna lose it, and you're gonna have a bad day. Um, so I can have the custom caching is set per disk. I can hot add and remove these things. So disks, I can hot add, I can hot remove. I just posted a video last week um, about Linux storage, and I'm showing you there a managed disk. I can just add and remove it anytime. It's super easy to kind of do that. The other thing I can actually do is I can share disks. So if I think about this virtual machine, it's connected to this data drive, there are some maybe types of database where I actually want a shared disk. So when I look at these disks, you'll actually see there's a max shares property on them. So if we go back and look, uh, I think it's on this one, let's have a look. 
Here, if I look at the documentation, we can see Haylock premium SSD ranges. Depending on the size of the disk, there's a max shares limit. So if I had kind of a P30, I could have up to five max share numbers configuration. For Ultradisk, it goes from one to five. And what this enables me to do is exactly as the name suggests, I could have multiple virtual machines connect to the same disk. So I could think about, hey, I've got this VM, and this VM. I've got this data disk. I wouldn't do it for the OS. They can both connect to the same disk. Now, these would have to be in the same, for example, availability zone. If it was supports availability zones, I can't mount cross zone. And it supports things like SCSI um, to persistent reservations. So I can actually use that as a shared disk in my Windows uh, or my Linux to maybe put database files if I need that. So I, I can actually have shared disks um, within the environment. And again, depending on the size of the disk, that really impacts how many connections I can actually have. I made a big deal about IOPS and throughput and how the disks have, so I have to understand what is my requirement on IOPS and throughput to make sure I pick the right disk sizes. Remember when we drew the VM, the VM also has limits on IOPS and throughput. So I need to make sure when I'm working out my sizing of my complete solution, it's no good attaching disks that have this massive amount of IOPS and throughput if the VM is too small to use it. So make sure when I'm planning out, remember that the VM also has IOPS and throughput limits and a maximum number of data disks. So plan out. What do I need in terms of IOPS and throughput capacity? And then make sure I'm picking a VM that's limits also match or exceed what the storage is going to provide that I need for my application to actually function. So don't add a ton of storage and 160,000 IOP ultra disk to a VM that's got a limit of 3,000 IOPS. Um, again, the logs would kind of show you you're hitting Remember those metrics and logs we talked about way at the start that are exposed up to us, those metrics and logs. I'd be able to see that, hey, I'm being throttled at the VM or the disk. I'll see I'm hitting a limit so I can troubleshoot the issue, but we don't want to get into that. Make sure you plan out, you understand what the requirements are, and then size everything, size the, the virtual machine and size the storage accordingly. Now, there are other types of storage service. Um, yes, managed disks are the key one when I think about a virtual machine. But remember, inside that virtual machine, I have an application running. See, so if I think for a second, let's just erase that for a second. So yes, this is a virtual machine. But what I care about is there's an application, and that app has different storage requirements. Now, if that app storage requirement is local block storage, then yes, I attach a data disk to it. It uses that. But we can also think about, well, there's, there's many other types of storage service in Azure. Remember that storage account I drew? Well, when I think about the storage account, I'll kind of come over here. If this is a storage account that I create, well, it supports things like Blob. And I can do block blob, page blob, append blob. We have things like tables, so those key value pairs. We have first in, first out queues. We have files, which today is really kind of SMB, but NFS is kind of there in preview as well. So these will be connecting over the network. So my app, hey, could absolutely connect and use those various types of services that are available. There's also obviously things like database services. So again, I, I can think about things like the SQL based that are maybe Postgres as a managed offering. There's MySQL, there's MariaDB. And obviously I can install anything I want in a VM, but these are managed offerings. They're just available. So I'm not worrying about updating databases or the security they're provided for me. 
there is things like Redis Cache. There's all these other things available that my app can use. And when I think about storage account, there's different performance tiers for Blob and files that can get like a, a premium experience. There's things like Azure NetApp files. So Azure NetApp files are NetApp appliances that I kind of, I create an account, a capacity pool of volume, and that volume gets exposed to a virtual network that I can then consume. There's things like Azure File Sync to replicate file shares from on-prem to an Azure file share in a storage account and then back to other file shares. So there's a huge array of different solutions available, way beyond the scope of kind of this overview. But don't limit yourself. The whole point is there's a lot of different capabilities. Understand what you're trying to achieve. Don't reinvent the wheel. If there's something out there as maybe a PaaS solution that I can leverage, use it. Okay, so we've been going a long time. We've covered VMs. We've covered kind of the base storage blocks. The last part is networking. So we drew at the start, actually, I talked about a region somewhere, and I said it's, hey, it's connected to this big Microsoft backbone, and we have this region is a two millisecond latency envelope. So if we go now and focus on the networking side, and I drew the idea there was a virtual network, if I think about the constructs that we have available, so I have a subscription. And then in my subscription, I can use one or more regions. And those two boundaries are what I can use to actually create A virtual network. So a virtual network lives within a particular region in a particular subscription. It cannot span regions, it cannot span subscriptions. So if I had five subscriptions in one region, I'd have to have five virtual networks. If I had five subscriptions, each of them using stuff in two regions, I'd have 10 virtual networks. And a virtual network is essentially defined as IPv4 CIDR ranges, i.e. sets of IP addresses, and optionally, I can have IPv6 as well. I don't have to, but I can. And then that virtual network is broken up into subnets, etc. And each subnet is a portion that I specify of these IP ranges. So it's a portion of the IPv4 address space. If I added an IPv6 address range to the virtual network, it can optionally have an IPv6. I always have to have IPv4. I can be dual stack, but I can't be IPv6 only. I, I have to have IPv4. I can have multiple IPv4 ranges. Um, now it's very common, you're going to use the RFC 1918, uh, the 10.172.16, the 192168, but you don't have to. If I have my own IP range, I can bring it to Azure, but even if you have your own network that's IP routable, if you bring that address space to Azure, they won't be internet routable, uh, internet addressable. To have something that's internet addressable, you have to use the IP addresses Azure can allocate to you. So I break up into subnets. Each of these has an IP space. So all of these are kind of these private IPs. So when I create a resource, let's say I create, for example, a virtual machine, it gets an IP address, it uses DHCP. Uh, I never statically configure the IP address. There's one scenario if I have multiple NICs, multiple IP configurations per NIC, but generally you don't. Uh, it's always going to get the IP via DHCP and the DNS configuration. So on the virtual network, I specify the IP and I configure what are the DNS configurations. This could be Azure, so it uses the Azure DNS, or it can be custom, 
where I can give it kind of the, the IP addresses of my DNS servers, which could be like uh, maybe my own domain controllers or something else. And then those get passed via DHCP into the VMs. Now, obviously, I'm drawing the VM in a subnet. It's obviously not in the subnet. Um, the VM has a NIC attached to it. The NIC attaches to a subnet. But fundamentally, I'm, I'm placing the VM inside a subnet. VMs can have multiple NICs. So I could have a VM that actually has NICs in multiple subnets, like a, some type of virtual appliance, but it can never have NICs in multiple virtual networks. I'm always bound to a single virtual network. And once again, the VM has certain numbers in terms of the number of NICs and the amount of throughput it can actually have. And that's defined when I look at the VM size, it will show me what my kind of network performance um, can actually be. Now, an important point here, these are, this is all layer three. So I, IP, and the traffic that's really supported is like TCP, um, UDP, as ICMP, I, I can ping things. But when you start, so that's obviously a layer four. When you start talking about other layer four things, it may work, it may not, but certainly a lot of the internal Azure constructs like network security groups and load balancers, um, they work on protocol, they work on TCP UDP. If you try and send something else through it, it's probably not gonna work, or there's no guarantee it's gonna work. I can't do things like VLANs. VLAN is layer two, this is layer three. Now a virtual network is by default kind of a unit of isolation. When I create resources inside here, these are all these private IP addresses. Now, if they try and talk to the internet, um, they can. There's no special subnet, there's no special thing I have to do. If I do nothing else, um, I can absolutely go outbound to the internet and get a response. Uh, depending on the configuration, like if I was behind a load balancer which had a public IP, it would use the load balancer for the, the snatting to get to the public I, uh, IP address I'm talking to. If I don't, Azure will just automatically assign something or there's a NAT gateway appliance I can add a managed service that the outbound internet traffic would go through Then I could control the IP address or IP prefix. Again, that's a more complex thing. There's other videos in the masterclass on that. But by default, I don't have to do anything else. They can all outbound get to the internet. Now, if I want to be able to offer services to the internet, well, private IP won't work. What I need is a public IP. Now, I can do an instance level public IP. So I could say, hey, this VM, or specifically this IP configuration on the NIC of the VM, um, you have kind of a, a public IP one, that it doesn't know about, but will essentially get redirected to its NIC. And then things from the internet could talk to it and go to the VM. We don't want to do that. What we would generally do, if we want to offer things to the internet, is we have the idea of kind of the Azure load balancer. The Azure load balancer could have a front end public IP configuration then it would have a back-end set, and its back-end set could point to multiple VMs for scale and resilience purposes. So that's kind of a front-end configuration would be public, and then a back-end to balance things. So if I actually want to get things from the internet, um, I, can, I can do that at kind of a, a layer four, the Azure Load Balancer, or I can do an internal private um, Azure Load Balancer. There's also a layer seven, the Azure App Gateway, that adds things like a web application firewall, WAF, and they can do things like cookie-based affinity. It can do more things because it understands things like HTTP. So there are different offerings to actually get things in from the internet. What about controlling it then? So, okay, great. Uh, by default, anything in the virtual network can talk to anything else in the virtual network. They can be in different subnets, but they can all talk to each other they can all go outbound to the internet. Maybe I don't want that. I wanna be able to actually control those things down. And I, I guess I should have pointed out, I said this was kind of TCP, UDP, ICMP. 
One of the things I can't do is there is no multicast. There is no broadcast. I, I can't do those things in an Azure virtual network. I want to control the flow of traffic. How, how do I do that? So by default, they all have these kind of complete um, flows between each other. There's different ways to control that flow. Now, one of them is network security groups. And that's probably the main built-in kind of uh, way to control the flow of traffic. So if I think once again, I, I kind of have that virtual network. And we have these different subnets. A network security group is really just a number of configurations around kind of the source IP, destination IP, the source and destination ports, um, protocol, and then action. And I can really think about the action as this kind of allow or deny. And then I apply those to the various subnets. Now, I can apply it to a NIC. They're actually enforced at the NIC level, but it's hard to manage. So we really think about creating these NSGs, and then I apply it to subnets, so it would control the flow of traffic. And again, there's more detail on these in the masterclass. I'm not going to go into that here. But what I could essentially do is I could say, hey, this DMZ is allowed to have inbound from the internet. It's not allowed on the others. I could say these are allowed to talk, but these are not allowed to talk, and these are not allowed to talk to the internet. There are things like app security groups where instead of having to use IP addresses, I can have tags on the network adapters. So that's kind of an easier way so I don't have to be bound by IP ranges. There's also things like service tags. So tags enable me to actually, based on various Azure services, they're available via a range of public IP addresses. That's very hard for me to track. Service tags equate to the public IP addresses of those services. So there's a tag for like Azure Storage in South Central. So if I wanted to let it talk to those, I could use this special tag for storage in South Central. And it gives me a more direct path to actually get to it for my virtual network. So I think of NSGs as a great way to actually control the flow of traffic. There are other things I can do. There's things like Azure Firewall. There are appliances that can do those things. But NSG is kind of that built-in micro-segmentation at the kind of virtual network level. A very common thing you're going to face, remember, the subscription, the region, is a boundary. It's like, well, I've got multiple subscriptions, or I've got multiple regions, but I want them to talk. So what we can do is if I have multiple virtual networks, I'm just going to draw it out here, we can do something called peering. And this is on the Azure backbone. It could be cross-region or in the same region. And it now enables these things to talk. There is a charge for ingress and egress, so you would factor that in. It is not transitive. So I can think about kind of this, this kind of spoke A and this spoke B, and maybe this is my hub. These can talk because they have a peering relationship. These cannot talk. If I want to enable that, I would either have to add a peering relationship between them directly. So if I have a lot of them, I'll end up with a big mesh. Or I can set up like Azure Firewall or a Network Virtual Appliance in the hub. And then we can use things called user-defined routes, routing tables. And I can basically say, if I had an appliance, let's just call it NVA1, and it has an IP address, I could say, hey, in this virtual network, if you want to talk to IP address range A, your next hop is NVA1. So now when it wants to talk over here, it knows to send it to this appliance that would then forward it on. 
And this one would have a user-defined route that would say, hey, if you want to talk to IP address range of B, go to NVA1. And it's not like a traditional network. This doesn't have to have an IP address in that subnet, or that I can actually have a next hop to things in different um, networks. Different, uh, that's fine. So I can enable this connectivity. If I have my on-prem, I want to connect it. The base, kind of the most simple way people start with, is I can actually use a site-to-site -site VPN. So I can kind of think about over the internet, <laughs> I, I have a, a managed gateway set of appliances here, and I have a site-to-site -site VPN, uh, policy or route-based, and I'm connecting this IP space to that IP space. If I've done this peering, well, then it could be these IP spaces as well. Another option would be Express Route. So I talked before about this massive Microsoft backbone network. There are all the different regions, and I said there were kind of these edge, these pop points of presence, these peering meet me locations. So the other thing I can actually do is something called Express Route. And with Express Route, what I'm actually doing is I connect my network to one of these edge locations. And then they kind of cross connect me to the Microsoft backbone. So I've connected my network to the Microsoft backbone. That, that's all I've done. Then over that Express Route, I can add something like um, private peering that actually now connects me to particular virtual networks. There's also Microsoft peering that lets me advertise via BGP other types of Microsoft service. And again, I go into detail with that in the masterclass um, that I would then access via this connection as well. Once I've done this, again, remember now these peers, if I turn on something called allow um, remote gateway and use gateway transit, these spokes can actually now get to these locations um, via that hub network's connectivity. So I, I get that capability kind of just um, thrown in for me. There are various costs of these. I'm paying kind of the, the provider, I'm paying for the gateway, I, I pay for the express route circuit. This can get kind of complicated to manage. So one of the things that is actually available, it's kind of weird the same color twice, um, you, you might hear of this thing called Azure Virtual WAN. And if I do Azure Virtual WAN, you end up with this managed hub that you don't really have any access to, but they then facilitate those peering connections, they enable that transitivity, they enable the express route, the site sites talks to each other, <clears throat> and then this kind of disappears from you. It's a managed network, but it's used by the Azure Virtual Way to, to facilitate that. So if you were maybe starting out, you could use this service to enable that connectivity. There are other services it's like uh, Azure Glo Express Route Global Reach. That if I had multiple locations connected to Express Route, um, they can actually talk to each other directly over the Microsoft backbone. Um, that, that's something else you can do. Um, I think we also want to cover, it's obviously a very long video already. I, I guess a, a key point is when you're deploying and think about your services, always think about kind of those blast radiuses. So really you always want to be thinking about deploying to at least two regions. Yes, within a region, I think high availability, I want to deploy across availability zones, but I want to deploy to at least two regions. It doesn't have to be the paired regions. There are benefits to that in terms of how Microsoft roll out updates. They would never do the same update to the paired regions. But always have at least two deployments. Or if the workload isn't um, maybe uh, critical, it depends on what my recovery time objective is, at least be able to redeploy my workloads. Maybe run a CI, CD pipeline, template. Maybe it's just my data has to be backed up or replicated. I mean, for virtual machines, again, we drew the idea that we have this disk. There is no concept here of these are three copies. 
there's no replication of a managed disk to another region. If I were to replicate to the other region in the app, I would replicate to an app running in a VM in another region, or there is Azure Site Recovery that does a VM level replication to another AZ or another region. So that's how I could replicate at a VM level. But from a networking perspective, if I end up now with maybe using multiple regions, which is kind of the recommendation, so I have multiple regions with my workload deployed, maybe it's active active, maybe it's active passive, if it's database is the state, maybe I'm doing kind of a, a database managed async replication. But what I don't want is for the person using my service to have to think about these two instances of my service. So fundamentally, I'll, I'll probably have like a public endpoint and a DNS name at each of these. I want a single place that this person can talk to. If the workload is HTTP or HTTPS, I can use Azure Front Door. So what that is going to do is use any cast to over all those different points of presence, make it available. The user can talk to it and it will then distribute it to my possible workloads. But again, that's only HTTP, HTTPS. If it's something else, maybe like DNS, I can use a Traffic Manager. So Traffic Manager will give me another name and then it can resolve based on performance or routing or whatever. In preview, there's an Azure Global Load Balancer, which is a layer four. They can basically redirect to other public facing load balancers. That's in preview right now. But definitely think about as I roll out services to multiple regions, I need a way to have the traffic distributed and split across them. So that, that's kind of a, a very high level state of the union, uh, where we are in start of 2021. Um, so many things, again, this is a, a summarization, very broad view. The masterclass is 20 hours. Uh, I do a weekly update, so check that out to stay up to date. And Microsoft has this cloud adoption framework that talks about how to set up a lot of these things as landing zones, the networks, um, the, the connectivity. I'd recommend going and looking at those for kind of a good head start. But I hope this was useful um, and I hope to see you on another video soon. Take care.